So today, I just want you guys, when I tell my story, you know, to, to find what you relate to. There's things you might not relate to, but I hope that you find something in my story that can inspire you to keep going. So as I said, and as you've heard, Kamlam Sebonga Beile, Tungumdana Wase Tukwa, Eastern Cape. So this is where I grew up. And the earliest memory of my childhood that my grandmother always shares. And I also believe that's where, I also believe when it comes to purpose or when it comes to what you should do in your life, we always tend to look outside of ourselves, right? Especially because we're on social media. We look people at Instagram, you're like, oh, I just want to be like that person. You know, you bombarded on TV with all this content. And sometimes you can feel like you don't have a purpose. Sometimes you can feel like people are doing better than you, right? And the first lesson I want to highlight is that God and the universe will always show you your purpose in glimpses. You must always look inside yourself. And for me, it began when I was a kid. So, you know, goats, cows, sheep, everything you can imagine. And my grandmother always says that, you know, around 6 o'clock, I will always try and bring, you know, the herd or the animals into the house. And my grandmother would always say, I was in the Nam Guten Uz, Simfu Yendlin, Didigam Nagumaku, but Makul is our Kotola Pant. So that's who I am. I'm that person that believes no matter where you are from in your walk of life, if you need my help and I'm able to help, I will help. And that's something I've always carried at a young age. And in my journey, it's something that has sometimes worked against me, you know, being taken advantage of and all those kind of things. But I believe when you are good with your intentions, people can take away your money, they can take away your followers, they can take away everything, but they can never take away your purpose. And while you're still breathing, <laughs> and while you are still breathing, you are God's idea in motion. Never forget that. So, okay, is it working? Are we good? Okay. So as I said, does I little do you? I moved to Cape Town while I was still young. One thing that always stood out for me with my childhood is that I loved my culture. I loved for me to like I don't know Nandi crazy umdana. And the reason why I loved my culture it was because of the women in my family. Every single day I would watch Umakuluam at five o'clock in the morning and I would watch her dress up in Libin Simbiza the headgear, and I'd always be like, it, it, it almost became this transition, because when she woke up, she'd be grumpy, and the moment she had that outfit on, it was like, <laughs> and for me, I wanted, I had this desire at, at like a five, I think I was five or six, and I was like, how do I give this confidence to people? I would notice that this way of dressing had some sort of power. It almost became like a mystery to me. Whenever I'd watch the women in my family, when they wore, it's a closer. Something about their spirit would spark, right? So as I said, I moved to Cape Town. And after I moved to Cape Town, I think I was around 13 or 14, I got a scholarship to go to one big boys. Now imagine it, Kabay Lindim, going from and now you're moving into a prominent white school. English, English basically at that point. <laughs> and I remember in my life, I was put in this environment for the first time of possibilities. And you could do music for free, you could play, so you can do all these things in this environment. And I remember one of my first days at school, um, my mom was, I, we couldn't afford Woolies food and all these fancy things. So my mom would always pack my lunch from the night before. So sometimes to school, sometimes chicken is closer, cook is closer, all these things. And, you know, all the white kids in my school would always be like, ah, oh, that stings, sour milk, ah. Oh. There, there was always some sort of reaction because I had brought this traditional food in a, in, in a setting where people didn't know about it. And at the beginning, it used to hurt me a lot because this is food from my culture that my mom had cooked that I really enjoyed. But in the environment I was in, everyone always had something to comment about my food. To the point where I would go to my mom and I'd say, Mom, 
Don't pack me lunch from the night before. Just buy me an apple from Woolies. Just in I'm to bring umdu. Yeah, bro. And my mom also, t and, and at that time, my mom taught me one of the most important things, and I also think this is also goes back to branding. And my mom was like, are you proud of your culture? Are you proud of Invela Piyako? I'm like, yes, I am. And she's like, why are you trying to change yourself to fit the validation of other people? And my mom was like, use this as an opportunity to spread. Oh, snap. My mom's like, use this opportunity to spread your culture and to talk about your culture and start a conversation about your culture. So that was also a transition in my life where I was like, actually, I'm going to be proud of Kopsabam. No matter where I end up, I'm going to be proud of my culture. And most importantly, I'm going to tell the stories of where I come from. Another thing that I had noticed growing up and being you know, at Weinberg and being in this environment was that after holidays, all the other kids would come back and talk about how they went to Naisna and played. And my mom would always send me to the Eastern Cape. Every single holiday, she would send me home. And the reason why my mom sent me home was she always believed that there needs to be a balance about who I am. I need to embrace my culture, but at the same time, I also need to embrace being modern. So at Weinberg, amazing five years at school, but... At the time, while I was at Weinberg, as, as stories of us black kids, is that my mom and my dad had a very toxic and abusive relationship. And I even remember when I was 14, starting grade 8, my mom and I had to move from where we were staying into a smaller house because my dad had left. And I remember my mom crying, we just moved into this house, I'm starting grade 8 tomorrow morning, and I remember the geezer burst and all of our clothes and everything was ruined. I went to school in wet uniform for my first day of grade eight. And I remember my mom saying to me that you are the first person in this family to go to a school like this. Make it mean something. Your circumstances don't determine your future. You determine your future. Yes, you might not have all the things that other kids have, but you've got a purpose. And I also remember at Weinberg would have this blazer ceremony because all these traditional boy schools must, they've been running for hundreds of years or whatever. So they had this blazer ceremony and I remember, you know, getting my blazer and my mom is like, Yom danam ungufana otungi weyo. At this point in time, I'm like, Uti mama na ungufana otungi weyo, like, like, what's happening? And he understand the concept and should always say, Dia itanda indlela ungubanga ayo. And if you don't have a job, you can't get a job. If you don't have a job, you can't get a job. High school goes by. I end up in matric. In matric, all the other, in this kind of boys' schools, it's very competitive. And all the other kids are playing for UCT. All the other kids, they're other rugby players playing for province. And I remember sitting and thinking, I don't want to go to university. Now, my mom, by profession, She's an educator. She's an educator. So imagine her first son who had gone to this brilliant school saying, Mama, I don't want to go to varsity. At that point in time, I didn't know why I didn't want to go to varsity, but I just had this feeling that if my mom has given me this opportunity to go to a school like this, I don't want to be in a space where I go to varsity, end up being in a job, and then that's my life. I wanted to do something. I, I just felt... This, I can't even explain it. it. It was in my spirit. I felt this overwhelming energy that this is not your calling. And I remember at the time, also Nan Soluga in, in my matric year. And I still remember coming back from the bush, and I remember this threaded, this Fana Utungweyo thing kept playing in my head. It just became louder, what my mom had told me. When I transferred it into English, it was the threaded man. And I kept thinking, Tom Ford, the threaded man, okay. Gucci, the threaded man. So another lesson in what I'm trying to say is that sometimes when an idea sparks, you never know where you're going to end up. And I feel that so often people always think that before they start, everything must be done. Abandaba means abakali because it's like, abandaba zotini, le idea, imal, indos tile. But for me, this threaded man thing kept playing in my head. I didn't know what the journey looked like. I didn't know if it was going to be a business or anything, but I just fell in love with the idea of the threaded man. 
Now, another thing about my high school career is that because at home I was going through this thing with my parents, my mom suffering from depression, trying to commit suicide, and all these things that I was dealing with, it almost created, almost not that I was a fake, but it created these two personalities. At home, yeah, it was bad. And then at school, you wouldn't be able to tell. Because my mom was like, But that also created a sense of loneliness. Because it felt like with my friends, I couldn't be fully who I am because I didn't want them to know what was happening back home. I didn't want them to see me as a broken child or coming from a broken family or people feeling sorry for me. And I remember at the age of 14, I got diagnosed with depression for the very first time. And at 16, I tried to commit suicide for the very first time. So I was also dealing with that in the background. So I get to matric. I decide I'm not going to go to varsity. I want to pursue fashion. And my passion for fashion also began because, because I sort of isolated myself because of what was happening at home. I would sit in front of the TV and watch fashion TV for hours. I know it sounds crazy. I didn't know why I was watching it, but these models, these outfits, I would just was used to sit and watch fashion TV. And I would look at all these misfit creatives who had built this economy for themselves. And I kept thinking in my mind that as black Africans, we have always been called savages. The way that we do things is not fully embraced by the world. When I open fashion magazines as a black South African kid who's not rich, we're being sold Louis Vuitton, we're being sold Gucci. I'm like, just because I can't afford Gucci and all these brands, what about me who can afford Upep or Edgar's or, you know, all these other, you know, lower, lower end brands? And I was like, there's a gap here. There's a gap here because we live in a country where 90% of us can't shop at Gucci, we can't afford all these things. But if you go to the township, you'll see one of the, some of the most stylish people on the planet. And I'm like, who's talking to these people about style? Then I was like, okay, let me start my blog, The Threaded Man. So it started off as a blog while I was in matric, just genuinely writing about style, but writing about style from a cultural perspective. What I noticed was that a lot of the brands were basing, or a lot of the publications were basing style on money rather than purpose and identity. And I also saw that as, as Africans, fashion for us is not just about style. It's also about who we are, telling our stories, where we come from. Certain colors mean certain things. So, so things like that, I found that, you know, all these magazines or these European publications, when they talk about Africa, they never dived into what style means for us as Africans in our, in our identity and expression. So I started The Threaded Man. I decided to move to Johannesburg to go to fashion school. Um, I remember at the time when I said I'm going to fashion school, my dad stopped talking to me. Um, everyone said I was gay. You should be doing law. You should be doing, you know, something of that caliber. My mom was very nervous because she was like, I'm going to fashion, but I'm going get a degree and have something to fall back on. And I also feel that as people of color, that's usually the trap for us, right? When we want to be creative, it's never the first option. It's always first do a degree and then fall back on that. You know, and then I was looking also at my white counterparts at school who are allowed to take gap years and find themselves. As black kids or as kids of color, there's always this pressure that we need to work and then send money back home. That's the option, right? And I also remember in my trick, my mom saying to me that she's been working a nine to five for 30 years. And I remember sitting in, my, in the car and having this cold feeling inside, thinking, if my mom has been working a nine to five for 30 years just to feed us and get us through schools, I need to make my life great. I need to break the cycle. Also, I watched my mom being the only educated person in her family and literally carry her family on her shoulders, black tax. And a lot of the times when people talk about black tax, they'll always say, no, leave it. No, black tax is important because at the end of the day, we don't choose that, that, that struggle. So I watched my mom 
try to put her kids through a good school, but at the same time, she's carrying her whole family, all her siblings on her shoulders. And also watching that inspired me because I was like, I need to break the cycle. Another thing that I watched in my family was that I was raised by women. All the men in my family checked out. And I also remember feeling the sense of, I need to be different as well. I need to grow as a man. I can't have this happen to my generation too. Anyways, I decided to roll um, at fashion school. My mom went to Old Mutual, withdrew all her savings. Because as you know, in South Africa, to do something creative is very expensive. And my mom was like, I don't know why you're going to this fashion school, but I hope that this is something you really want to do. So I moved to Joburg. I took a bus, longest trip of my life. I arrived in Joburg, CBD. I'd never actually left Cape Town at this. I've never traveled anywhere else between, except between Eastern Cape and Cape Town. That's the only thing I've ever done. So for the very first time, I was in another city. I'd only seen Joburg on SABC One TV shows. So that's my only reference of Joburg. But I get to Joburg, I get to Lysoff, I do my registration, I tell the receptionist, hey, Sissy, I don't have a place to stay. Because my mom could only give me so much money, and I literally had to find a place for myself. So, my, so the receptionist lady is like, listen, I know some cheap places you can stay at at the red back taxi rank. And this was about 15 to 20 kilometers from my school. So went to stay at Randbeck Taxi Rank, paying cheap rent, staying with like a weed dealer. <laughs> Not really. Sleeping on the floor, eating potatoes every day of the week, make mashed potato on a Monday, roasted potato on a Tuesday, chips on a Wednesday, boboti on a Thursday. So I found all these ways to just survive and push this passion that I didn't know anything about. I arrived at fashion school. F fashion school was the most horrible experience of my life. I couldn't draw guys on Guazubala to save my life. So all the creative classes, all the kids were drawing this beautiful, you've seen most of these beautiful fashion sketches. I couldn't do that. I would go to garment construction where you are taught how to make clothes and patterns. My hands were too big, I played rugby. So each time I would try and sew, I would cut myself, I'd get frustrated, and the lessons were six hours long, I just didn't fit in. But the one subject that I really loved was fashion trends. Because fashion trends was going into the psychology of how do you create something that people don't know they want until they see it? How does the trend curve work? How does culture connect to trends? What, you know, what, what it, it, it's, it goes into the psyche of fashion and why people consume fashion. And what that did for me, because I'd started my Threadman blog, I'll take some of those lessons and share them on my blog because I wanted to teach other black people about style and about trends. So halfway through my year at Lysoff, what ends up happening is I'm failing every subject at this point. And I even remember, most, they read from top mark to the bottom mark. Oh, I hate that. Oh, my goodness. So each time in all these classes, garment construction, they would read the girl has the top mark, and I was always the lowest mark. And I even remember at some point, everyone clapping for me in class, because everyone's like, why is this guy still coming to class when we all know he's failing? Yeah. And ironically, for trends, I was the top student for trends in my grade, in my year. So it was quite a weird thing, and all the lectures didn't know what was going on. They're like, how can you be failing everything, but you're getting 95% for trends? And at this time, my mom also finds out that obviously I'm failing. So my mom is like, Sia, lenda le fashion, zanga yenza sense, kabuele kaya, upeke UCT, or AU dubs. So I say to my mom, no, I feel that I want to push this thing. This blog is a passion of mine. My mom's like, okay, cool, I have to cut you off because I don't have any money. I have to also look after your brothers. So my mom cuts me off. I dropped out of Lysoff, but when I dropped out of Lysoff, I had my student card. And I knew what time the receptionist would arrive, should arrive at like 6 a.m. and should always leave quite late. So while I was not a student that while I was not a student at Lysoff, I still used my card so that I could access the computer labs to update my blog. So all the, so throughout the whole year, I'm a dropped out student, but I'm going online, updating my blog, reading what's happening on Vogue, going back to my notes, updating my blog. 
Funny thing happens, my blog becomes big in Nigeria. Yeah, crazy. My blog becomes big in Nigeria, and people are loving it in Nigeria. It's an amazing blog. I start getting mentions. I start getting on Instagram. So this is my Instagram page at the time. And I remember one of my first big breaks was True Love Magazine doing a feature on my blog. They had heard about it. They would seen about it online. So they write this feature. And I remember the feature was on the same page as Bonang's Revlon ad in True Love Magazine when she had launched her Revlon collaboration. So I'm showing my mom. I'm excited. I've never been in a magazine. I'm showing my friends. And everyone around me was saying, this feature is this small. Like, it, it, no one, and it literally was, it was not, it, I think the, the feature was even three sentences. But for me, it was such a big deal. So I was showing everyone, but everyone kept telling me, no one's going to see that. Everyone's going to see Bonang. Remember I told you that God shows you your life in glimpses. So I said to everyone, I'm like, yes, the feature might be small, but it's on the same page as Bonang. Everybody that looks at that page, they will see my feature. God is in the neighborhood. <laughs> right? While at this time I'm pushing the blog, I'm also interning for a trend um, analyzing company. And I remember I arrived for this internship. I'm like, you know what? I've got this Threaded Man blog. I'm going to intern here. I'm going to tell these people about my dream. And then together we're going to work. I've always had a passion also to involve people in my vision. I also tend to think that sometimes as people, when we have a vision, we want to isolate ourselves. But for some reason with my vision, I always wanted to share it with people and work together with people. And I remember I interned for this trend analyzing company. I was being paid 300 bucks. All that money was being used just for taxi. I was working Monday to Friday. And I remember going to my boss at the time saying, yo, booty, I've got this idea, the threaded man. It focuses on African millennials. It focuses on how we can look at style. I want to do these projects, all these different things. And I remember my boss saying, this is a crap idea. It's not going to work. You don't have a natural flair for fashion. It's just not going to work. And I remember being crushed because I kept interning at all these places where I was being told that I do not fit the fashion mold. And I'm proud to be Likaba. But I was always told that I don't have style. I can't draw. I can't do all these fancy fashion things that other people could do. And early on, that also taught me that when you have a purpose in your life, do not look for validation from other people. I also feel that a lot of us, when we sit with our vision, we idolize people so much to the point where we think they're going to make the dream happen for us. And sometimes we even think that telling them about it, their endorsement matters. But God from early on showed me that So I pursue this threaded man thing. I'm attending events. What ends up happening is that I got contacted by SAB. They were launching a new brand called Flying Fish. And that was the first time I ever heard the term influencer. They're like, Sia, we want you to be an influencer. We're launching this beer, Flying Fish. I'm like, oh my god, I'm an influencer. Didn't know what it meant. Didn't know what it flippant meant. All I knew was these guys wanted me to pose with this beer and post it. I was like, this is great. And they were offering to pay me for it. I was like, I could have done it for free, for free beer, but OK. I didn't know anything, guys. I'm just focusing on my purpose and my passion. So we end up doing it. That was my first ever feature in a big um, newspaper. And on this shoot, I met a young lady called Nomuzi Mabena. Nomuzi Mabena, MTV VJ, and she had followed me on Instagram. She had seen my blog. She had friends in Nigeria. So she's like, dude, you are the drip god. I'm like, but I'm broke, though. Like, <laughs> you know, like, no one knows me. Um, she's like, do you want to be my stylist? I say to her, yeah, I'll be your stylist. In my mind, I'm like, Tukowam doesn't don't go stylish, I'm a dropout. You know, all these things in my mind are like, yo, how are you going to style someone? But then I learned early on that when God anoints you, it doesn't matter whether you're qualified or not. That's the difference between anointed and appointed. When you're appointed, it's just a position. When you're anointed, it's a purpose. And I think... 
And I think another lesson is that when you start your dream, in the lies wamba so is a wamba. Yeah, gone. So I could have said no to the styling and say, oh, but I don't know how to style. But I was like, if God is pushing me in this direction, I'll do it. So I agreed to style Nomuzi. I go online. I'm looking at styling videos from all the celebrity stylists I've seen. I'm watching videos of Kyle Lagerfeld, you know, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I start styling Nomuzi. She joins um, Cash Time Fam. And the first video that I ever worked on to style was Karakar which was a big moment. And I didn't know at that time it was going to be a big song. So what ends up happening through Nomuzi, I end up starting to style Cash Time Fam. And within a couple of months, I'm styling every major music video for every major artist in the country. <laughs> right? <laughs> but guys, let me tell you this. I was being paid peanuts. I'm still broke at this time. Yeah. And I think that's also another thing that I want to teach is that when also, when you have a purpose, there's a period of time where you'll have to serve. Where you'll have to serve. And I saw these years as my serving years. This time, I'm getting pressure from my parents. But and I'm saying to my mom, I'm like, I need to pay my dues. I need to work to make sense, right? My collaboration with Mamuzi goes well. And it gets to a point now where I get invited to a conference. Guys, at this time, I'm winging everything. I can't, let me be I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going. So I end up being invited to a conference, an industry conference about music and fashion. In the audience, there's, um, there's the guy at the time, Urifilo Ramakosi, who was the CEO of the South African Music Awards. So now, me being an idiot, going to be Ted. Sometimes in Kabis and Kyal. So I'm in this panel. I'm talking about how our fashion award shows don't support local fashion. I'm like, I look at the Oscars. I look at the Grammys. Why aren't the summers like that? Why aren't we pushing fashion? Why aren't we creating this platform for creativity? You know, I'm tired of seeing bad style on our red carpets. Gandila Putwa from the summers is listening. After the talk, he come, at this time, I am 21 years old. He comes to me, he's like, I'm busy planning the summers. Do you want to be the fashion director? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, of course. But I'm thinking, guys, also the thing about Joburg is everybody that meets you and you're creative, there's always these discussions of, eh, we must work together, we must collaborate, but people will never call you. They sell you dreams. So I'm thinking, this guy is selling me dreams. Obviously, I'm going to say yes, but he's not going to call me back. And three days later, this guy calls me back. He's like, do you still want to do the summers? I'm like, yes. He's like, you're doing it. You're going to be the youngest fashion director ever. Guys. <laughs> I know it sounds nice right now, but at that time, then you saw Yika because it's over 100 outfits. It's dancers. It's celebrities. It's presenters. I'm a dropout. <laughs> So I call my mom. I'm freaking out. I'm like, hey, mama, I don't know what I got myself into. Like, I'm doing this African Music Awards thing. I don't know what to do. It's happening in Durban. I don't even have, at this point, I was an employees, but to none. So I'm just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this job. My mom's like, you are anointed. Accept the opportunity and see what you can do. So the awards are happening in Durban. So I decide, OK, cool. My vision and my purpose has always been to tell African stories, the stories of our people, the stories of Abandabam Nyama. So for the Psalmers, I decide on a theme, because it's happening in Durban, and I'm like, if I had to see Ushaga Zulu no Queen Nandi today, what would they look like? So that becomes my theme. Then I'm like, okay, cool. Since I'm, I can't, you know, I failed my creative design, I know there's designers who could use this platform. So I approach the designers, and I attach each celebrity to a designer, each presenter to a designer. And I just gave the designer the vision. I'm like, Ukanyimbau must be Ukwinandi. This is what I want. Went to another designer. I'm like, Usomizi must look like this. This is what I want. And while all this is happening, it gets revealed to the media that I'm the youngest fashion director. Now, there's been other stylists in the industry who are legends. But then they started speaking out, speaking out against me, saying, how can the Summers be so irresponsible hiring a 21-year-old that no one knows? 
So there's all this chatter because everyone's like, who's this kid? Where is he from? And I remember I'm freaking out, trying to make this thing happen, but God willing, it happened. And the Psalmers at the time, in 2016, they were the highest viewed Psalmers in history with over 1.6 billion views across the internet, across TV. And, and yeah, so I did the South African Music Awards. While I'm doing the South African Music Awards, obviously the business is now growing. So now I'm an influencer, I'm doing stuff with a couple of brands, I'm being invited to events. And at some point in the journey, I end up being approached by business partners who are like, Sia, we love what you're doing. We love the idea of the threaded man would like to invest in your business. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. And at the time, you were suffering with your dream. You are always waiting, you know, obviously because you're with your dream, Imali is a big thing, especially for us as black people. And so these investors came with a sum of money to invest in my business, and I got very excited. Because now I'm like, I'm going to be rich, baby. That's what I was thinking. And in that transaction, I ended up signing away 75% of my business without realizing. Yeah. I signed a shareholder's agreement, didn't have any lawyer advice, didn't, know, didn't even know what a shareholder agreement is. All I heard was these guys saying to me, Sia, we're going to invest 100000 into your brand. And I'm like, yes. So while I'm doing the Psalmers, I've got these business partners. What starts happening now is that obviously the Threaded Man brand is growing, but also the Sia Beila brand is growing as a result of this platform. But I'm not aware. And what I also didn't realize is that in the contract, not only did I sign away my business, but I also signed away my name. Yeah. So while I'm doing the summers, we're being paid, the company is now starting to make some profit. But my salary is like three grand, and I'm not understanding why. So I had friends who are at Wits Law School, and I said to my friends, hey guys, can you please look at my shareholder agreement? Because I you know, I've never actually gotten any legal advice. A friend of mine, I give it to him, I think, on the Monday. The Monday evening, my friend calls. He's like, boy, Ziyashu, Bacho. You think, Gandhi, this brand is yours. It's not yours. Even the 25% shares that you think you have, they're in escrow, right? So what escrow means is that if I'm buying your business, or I'm buying shares into your business, I could say to her that her shares are in escrow, meaning that the longer she works in the company, the more she earns those shares, right? So for me, my 25%, I'd only earn it in 10 years. Yeah. Then I also had a non-compete of 10 years as well. So if I decided to leave my business for some reason while these guys have invested, it means I wouldn't be able to work in the creative fashion industry at all. Mind you, I don't have a degree, so what would I do, right? So my friend calls me that evening. He's like, boy, it's either you leave this brand right now or you speak to your shareholders to give you a better deal. You're bringing the clients. You're bringing, you are the one carrying the business and the brand. So also being a black person, you know, working with these powerful white Afrikaans billionaires, I get into a space where I get scared because I don't want to rock the boat, Right? Prime example of rocking the bloat as black people, when we go to a restaurant and we find a piece of hair in our food, we move it to the side. A white person calls the flippant manager. I'm not paying for my meal. Because as black people from apartheid, we're always taught to abide, to be respectful. But sometimes we, we want to be respectful at our own detriment, even when we are being treated unfairly. So I decide that, you know what? I'm going to speak to these guys about the business. And I'm going to let them know that something has to happen, has to change. I called a shareholders meeting. I'm thinking, this is my moment. Black ownership, black power. I arrived in that meeting. I think I walked in, there were like 20 lawyers. And the chairman of the board said the following words to me. He's like, money talks, bullshit walks. He's like, you're either going to stay in your current deal or you can leave the business and we'll find another CRBler to replace you because we own everything. I resigned from my business. Now, the ironic thing 
is that in the media, I had just done the Psalms. I'm being celebrated. I made Forbes 30 under 30. Yeah, right? While I'm Forbes 30 under 30, and the Sakeki in the background, because I'm like, people think I own this business. People, I, I, you know, I own the, like in terms of the concept and the idea, it's mine, I'm driving it, but I don't actually have the ownership of what I've started. And this also gets me to another lesson in personal branding is that you need to give yourself time. And I've seen so many black creatives sign away their ideas because of money. Because of money. And it's not a bad thing because, yes, we are broke. But we need to have enough faith in our dreams to understand that in due time, God will answer. And now had I waited six months, I would have not got into that contract and my brand would have blown up naturally. Because what I discovered through that shareholders agreement was that those guys, out of the money that they had committed to the business, they actually only invested 10 grand. That's all I needed at the time, but my focus was so much on money now, quick gratification, I need to be rich now, you know? So, anyways, I'm being celebrated, I'm Forbes, best dressed, young and celeb at this point. The celeb, and their papa, wherever I go, people are like, see how we need to take a picture, but and I'm getting depressed. No, really. So it gets to a point where I decide to resign from my own company. After I resign from my own company, what do my shareholders do, or my ex-shareholders? They send an email to every single brand I've ever worked with. Because they had access to my emails, and they were like, Sia Bail is a fraud, do not work with him, he doesn't own the threaded man, it's not his idea, it's our idea. Every single brand I was working with dropped me, because they were like, Sia, we don't know what's going on, but this is too controversial for us, right? And that happens to a lot of us as black creatives. The system is built to isolate us when we're in time of need and when we're in trouble. True. So I decide to then drop out of my business um, for about six months. I'm now using the Sia Baila brand. As I said before, most I had built the thread man, but also Nam Gogo. I'm, you know, Saleb Nyana. I'm being invited to events, the influencer. So I start doing these influencer gigs to basically sustain myself and survive while I figure out what to do with my life. Then it gets to a point where because I had signed a non-compete, these guys are seeing that I'm doing work, so they decide to sue me. Guys, imagine you're being sued. I will now have a five friend account in your account. Yeah, I can No, really. They are sure. So these guys decide to sue me. I'm now going to court, and basically I'm being sued by my own concept. Imagine, like, a year ago, you were alone in this thing. A year later, the same concept you're starting the same concept, your baby, your, a company that you've built, a company that you suffered for, is now being taken over by other people who are now suing you, saying that you are the enemy of your own company. So I go through this trial period. A friend of mine at the time, as I said, my friend of mine who was at WITS, the following year he had started working as, an, as a junior associate at Workman's. So he starts doing something very illegal where he's giving me legal advice, you know, on the side, because he's like, yo, man, you're my, you're my friend, you're black, but I know that my company wouldn't want to take your case, and I'm also not in the bar, but again, there's a man and advisor. So I'm going to court with no lawyer, going on a script that's been written by, by my friend. So the court case gets to a point where the judge basically rules that these guys should actually give me my company back, but I have to buy it back. Yeah, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they gave me resources that I'd never had before. They gave me an office space. They gave me access to graphic designers. So the judge was like, I have to recognize that whatever money they had spent, it had built value. And the brand wouldn't be where it is if it wasn't for that value. So we go through a process now where the judge says, cool, get a mediator, evaluate the company, work out a deal. Cool, so the evaluation of the company gets done, and the company is valued at 10 million. Yeah. And at that time, also, being it, how can a website be valued at 10 million? You know? 
So I started learning with EY, so and they get professional companies like Ernest & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers to basically work and do the evaluation. And basically the evaluation was based on the amount of followers that we have, our database, how many hits do we get every single day, how many hits do we get per month, what is the conversation about our brand in the market that we operate in, how big is our influence. So if we tweet something saying, don't wear jackets, how many people react to that? So the evaluation was based on that, also based on clients I'd work with, also based on you know, the clients that, or the money that we had incoming. So it was based on a number of things, but the company was, was valued at 10 million. So now I'm like, cool, if the company is, based in, at, you know, is, is valued at 10 million, how am I gonna buy this company back from these guys for 10 million? Like, you know, I'm still broke. So anyways, we go through a process now where these guys are like, okay, cool, Sia, we can sell you your business for five million. Second, I wanna be five million in the Stalin Abo. Like, even if I had to sell everything my parents or everything my family owned, Zos and Fig with five million. So I then speak, so then at this time I'm also doing talks for a bank. I can't mention the bank because of legalities. I'm doing talks for a bank and I talk to the guy at the bank. I'm like, guys, do you lend people money to buy their businesses back? This guy says to me, Yes, we do. We've got something called ED, sp ED Spend where we help young entrepreneurs either build businesses, acquire shares in businesses, or buy back their businesses. So I meet with this bank, I give them the lay down of my company and everything, and these guys are like, cool, Sia, we'll lend you the money to buy this business back, but we can't buy it back for five million. So then the guys from the bank, because now I don't have lawyers, the guys from the bank get their lawyers to negotiate with these guys, and the money gets brought down to 2.5 million. Yeah. Isati, wow, the tata be 2.5 million. The tata. So, so essentially now it goes down to 2.5 million. Standard Bank says, okay, I'll mention them. They're a good bank. Standard Bank says to me, we'll give you the 2.5 million, but then, you know, you're going to have to pay it back. At this point, I'm not focusing on the paying back part. I'm focused on, I need to buy my business back part. Right? So what ends up happening is, I remember the day that the money came into my account. I remember, guys, for, for like five minutes, I had 2.5 million in my bank account. I remember, because it has to be transferred into my bank account, and I'd have to then pay the money to their bank account. And I remember I sat there for 10 minutes. I'm like, I'm a millionaire, baby. <laughs> yeah. Then I sent the 2.5 million to these guys, and I remember being hit with that regret of, I really, really pray and hope another black creative doesn't go through this. When you build your idea, and because you don't trust in it enough, or because of money, you end up selling yourself short, and now you find yourself a year later buying your own idea for 2.5 million. Now, I buy back the business, I'm excited, I'm like, oh, here we go, I'm an owner now, the CEO, Magu, Magu Lalwe. Only to realize that in the transaction, the only thing that I was actually buying were, were the IP rights. So I lost all the office space, I lost, all the resources that I had, and the only thing was I had was an empty bank account in the company's name, and literally just the website. I didn't think that I need working capital. Zanga Dave Bain don't need working capital. Nandiaz Londole. But anyways, we push forward with the vision because I'm still making money with brands and everything on the side. I get a team together, and I decide to launch a project called The Threaded Year to relaunch the magazine. And the Threaded Year was about opening up the platform now to other voices. Because the Threaded Man, for quite a long time, it was about me and my style and me sharing my tips. But I got tired of me and I was like, this platform needs to be about all of us. No matter how much I try, I can never fulfill everybody's needs. It needs a collective voice. I need more black people involved. And that's when we launched the Threaded Year. Right after we launched the Threaded Year, we got the award for the biggest fashion lifestyle blog in Africa. And we found ourselves being bigger than some of the leading magazines in the country. Yeah. So pushing the vision, everything is going great. You know, Threaded Man is flying high. We're doing covers. We're talking about, you know, brands like Latuma, basically using the platform to uplift others. I end up being invited to Europe for Fashion Week. I'm styling Galbro Union, who was one of my idols. Yeah. So I'm traveling across Europe. 
I've now entered the world, I've arrived, Humunati. But while this is happening, Diagoa still. Why? I borrowed 2.5 million that I have to pay back. Real, real talk. So I moved from one issue, now I'm in another issue. The bank wants 50 grand or more a month. I have employees that I have to pay. And literally, all I did was, at the time, was just work. I would work from 5 in the morning up until 3 in the morning the next day. I stopped eating. I would see my family only once a year at that time. Yeah? And literally, what started to happen internally, I started to crumble again. Depression started to kick in because I have pressure of this money that I have to pay off. And on top of that, I've got employees that I have to pay. But John, I and the famous, right? Then in 2017, a rare opportunity comes along. A South African billionaire calls me while I'm in Paris and says, I want to buy your business. I'm like, oh my God. Again, I'm excited, right? And this is someone I looked up to. This is someone I'd seen on magazines and TV. You know, black billionaire. I'm like, oh my God. Do you black billionaire now if he wants to buy my business? Oh my gosh. So this guy says to me, listen. So I said to him, I'm in Paris. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm up to. He's like, I'll send my jet. I'll fly you back to South Africa. I'm like, what? <laughs> cool. So I come back to South Africa. I meet with this billionaire. We have an amazing conversation how we want to collaborate and build Africa. They also own a certain event in the fashion industry. And basically, they're like, cool, let's work together on this event. While that happens, you know, get lawyers to then our lawyers to then, you know, negotiate the deal of how the purchasing of this business will work. So I get involved in this project. And part of the project now, this is another lesson, payment terms, guys. Yo, can you got payment terms? So they say to me, cool, Sia, we'll pay you a deposit. In the meantime, you pay the other half for the project. When the project is done, we'll pay you the next 30%, right? Now, because we owe F&B money, each time we are late, so if, I think it was every month on the 25th, F&B would withdraw the money from account. So each time payments were late, F&B, um, Standard Bank would then charge interest because we're late, late penalties. So what ends up happening in this project is that we pay, you know, we pay for half of the money to do this project. The project happens, everyone knows about it. It was during Fashion Week, I'm being celebrated everywhere. But what ends up happening is that the deal of the purchase of my company falls through. And the reason why it falls through is that the billionaire wanted to buy my company for 300,000 rands. And my lawyers were like, how can you buy a company for 300,000 rands when it's valued at almost 10 million and probably even more now if we do a valuation? So that doesn't work out. And also part of the deal is that they wanted 75% to 80% ownership and I would have to become the creative director. So my role would decrease and then they would combine it with another company, they would merge it with one of their companies and form a new company. So my lawyers and I disagreed. We don't want to do this. The other guys on the other side of the table, they get angry. After the project we had completed, they refused to pay me the 30%. That was old. And now the company has no money because we had spent half investing in the project thinking we're going to re receive the money that we had spent. At that time, I have to pay employees. At the same time, I owe 2.5 million, right? What ends up happening with this issue is that my employees stop getting paid. Guys who were involved in the project, I couldn't pay them. And then hell broke loose. People went on social media saying, Sia Bela is a fraud, screw him, calling me all these names, all these different things. I get into such a deep, deep depression, feeling so powerless. People that I had worked with in the, in the industry see these stories, and instead of calling me and asking me if I'm okay or if people can help me, instead they were tweeting about me. And it's one of the biggest issues I find in the black community is that we celebrate each other's failures. See, I turned into a trend online, so I turned into a band. Everybody that I knew personally, they were tweeting all these things about me, all these things about me. And I remember it got so bad to the point where it was in the news. 
So I couldn't leave my house. Each time I left my house, I would hear people saying, you nangla putunga patalabandu. I would turn on the TV. I remember turning on the TV, watching ENCA with my family, and they're talking about celebrities who've had a bad year. And I remember they were talking about Kanye West and how he lost his mind. And then they're like, yeah, nabo siyabeyile. You know, they've lost their minds. No, really. And I remember inside, I'm feeling all this pain, obviously, because this is a horrible experience. But as I always say, God shows in glimpses. And I remember thinking, they're mentioning me and Kanye together. <laughs> obviously. You know? But still, they're going. But I don't say this to anyone. These are the thoughts that cross in my mind. They talk about Kanye having a breakdown. I'm having a breakdown. This is trendy, right? <laughs> this must be the right direction. As I said before, God shows you things in glimpses, right? Even through the worst situations. Sometimes you think you're going through a crucifixion, but you don't actually know that you're being elevated to the next level, right? So at that time, I'm going through this horrible crushing in my life, but I'm not aware that I'm going to the next level. Depression sets in. I stopped going out. I stopped eating. I started sitting at home, not showering, and I'd, all, I'd stay in bed. And I remember it got so bad to the point where I think at some point I was in bed for a week. Didn't get up to go eat. Didn't get up to do anything. Didn't charge my phone. I would stay in bed for a week because I had so much. I was angry at myself. I'm being tweeted about. My family also doesn't know what's happening. Some family members believe me, but they don't. People think that I spent money in the Ikili Mali. And I got to a point where I decided I'm going to die. So I remember at the time, I'm messaging my friends that, guys, I'm going through depression. My friends are sending me messages of affirmation and all these things, and they're telling me that you're going to be fine. But one of the things that people don't understand about depression is that it's not about the fact that you hate your life or the fact that you don't want to be alive, but it becomes a thing, a thing in your psyche where you're like, being alive and fighting for happiness is actually tiring. And it's draining. And why should I be on this planet when I could be somewhere else? where I don't have to fight to stay alive or be happy. So I remember at the time I woke up, I think it was a Friday, I woke up, I packed all my clothes, packed my apartment. I remember I took my last shower. I'm like, this is my last shower. Um, taking my last shower. I remember even I put on a suit. I'm like, okay, if they found me hanging up from the ceiling, at least the style must be maintained, right? No, I planned this. Then I went and I bought rope, and I'm like, no, this rope is not nice. I need, like, a rope that has a bit of color. <laughs> How crazy is that? Like, I know, right? I sound so mad when I talk about this, but I think it's so important to share because we don't share these things, right? So I'm like, yeah, let me kill myself. Let me get this over and done with. So the biggest mistake that I made or what actually saved my life is that I didn't lock the door. And I remember... Everything was set up. I'd pack my bags. I'm like, I'm going to kill myself. I went to my balcony, had a bit of an inchy. I'm like, <sighs> you know, reflecting. And I'm thinking in my mind, okay, after I smoke my inchy, I need to go to the door and lock it and then do the deed. But I forgot about the door. And I hanged myself. And I remember feeling my body, like feeling my spirit starting to leave my body. It's a weird feeling. And I blacked out. And I'm dead at this point. Right? I wake up two days later in a hospital. My hands are tied to the bed. Um, and I remember feeling a feeling of failure, feeling so ashamed, feeling that I've lost everything. I'm no longer that Forbes, then a 30 year Beile. I'm no longer that. I'm like, I've peaked. This is over. And I remember my mentor, my grade five teacher, who's still my mentor today walks into the room, and she played me a song by Mac Miller, right? And she's like, while you're still alive, you're going to make things happen. And she's like, you need, if you want to live, you're going to live. If you want to die, you'll die. You need to make a choice. And that day, I made a choice to live and never look back. And then, obviously now, I'm still in debt. I'm still broke. I decided to move back home to the Eastern Cape. I lost my apartment. 
I remember some of my clothes got taken on auction because now debtors want their money. So my clothes are on auction. I'm selling stuff that I could sell, all these different things. This moment, I'm embarrassed. You know, I'm looked at as a has-been. My mom and I stopped talking because what am I going to say to her? She doesn't understand my industry. You know, she doesn't understand what it is that I do. But I go back home to spend time with my gran. And I remember the first couple of days and weeks, I just stayed in bed, didn't go outside, didn't do anything. And I remember one day I wake up, my grandmother wakes up every day at five o'clock till this day. So one day I ask her, why do you wake up at five o'clock? Why do you do all these things? Like you don't have a job, you don't have to work, my mom's working, you should be chilling and retiring. And my grandmother's like, purpose doesn't stop just because of people or circumstances. Purpose has to keep moving. And she's like, you have to keep moving. Yes, you might have lost the money. Yes, you might be in debt. Yes, people might not love you. Yes, people might say all these things. But the one thing they can't take away from you, and you have to sit, heal, confront some of the parts of you that haven't healed, and also allow God to work and, allow, and give God time. So for six months, I got into the space where I was working on my soul. Um, as I said before, my dad and I had a crazy relationship where he left my mom, so for years I was angry with him. And during this, the, during this period of time, I started talking to my dad again, and there was a lot of healing. Then I started confronting myself about my dream and my purpose, where did I go wrong? And I found that purpose again. And then I remember, after about a year, I decided that I would give this threaded man thing another chance. The biggest fear was, I'm controversial, no brand is going to touch me, because the moment a brand touches me, someone's going to be like, yeah, all these things. And literally, I came back to Joburg for three months. I wasn't making any money, living off friends' couches. Imagine that. You were this Forbes out of the 30, being celebrated by the South African Music Awards, all these incredible things, but now you're the guy that needs to sleep on people's couches. But at that time, I remember, you know, my mom telling me that, keep going, keep going, you're going to be okay. Then, within a couple of months, I managed to relaunch my platform again, The Threaded Man, with a newfound purpose. I managed to launch my own website. Straight after that, I decided that, because I'm not, I'm not someone who is very confrontational or very spiteful, if someone says something horrible to me, my first instinct is not to respond or defend myself. My first instinct is always, how can they be learning in this space, right? So I decided to start my own podcast where I was talking about what I was going through through every single step of rebuilding my brand with purpose again. And I think you guys should listen to it, actually. It's quite raw. Um, and then... While I'm figuring out what to do, I get approached by Unilever, by a brand called Vaseline. And they say to me, Sia, we want to work with you, make you our brand ambassador, our influencer, and go and we want to work with your purpose. We love what you're about. I say to them, guys, you know, I'm controversial. You saw what happened on social media. You saw what happened. And the CEO at the time of Unilever says to me, my boy, this is normal in business. This happens all the time. I used to lose a lot of money. These things happen, but you can't stop. You have to keep going, and we believe in your brand. So then I do work with Unilever. My company starts peaking again. And all the people that had been tweeting bad stuff about me all of a sudden come back, and they're like, I'm so sorry I spoke badly about you. Can we work with you again? Yeah. And then also I become the youngest African Personality, we on the cover of GQ. That was a GQ cover. Um, and then in December last year, I got a call from Global Citizen to be one of the fashion directors. I got, yeah. So that's also another thing that I learned, again, going back to this point. When you are anointed, when you are anointed and not appointed, God will make a way. Because... 
all these doors were closed on me, but somehow God opened other doors, right? I even got invited to Chile to be a keynote speaker at a creative festival. Imagine that, going through that experience, all of a sudden, you are being invited to Chile. Who knows about you in Chile? Yeah, well, so I end up going to Chile to give a talk. My brand keeps growing. I then do a collab with Ricky Rick and Vaseline. I'm sure you guys, I think you might have seen these. And then this year, we did another collaboration where we launched one of our unique um, tubs. And this is actually what I want to show you about authentic branding, is that before I went through my crushing or through my bad experience, I was doing a lot of work, but I wasn't actually creating using my story. I don't know if that makes sense. Because so often when you're an influencer, a brand is just like, hey, here's a bottle or here's a shoe, pose with it, that's it. it you don't get ownership over the narrative. You don't get to direct your vision. You don't get to attach your vision to something bigger. So since I came back, I was like, you know what? I've lost a lot of money. I've made a lot of money. But one thing that I'll never do is sacrifice my ownership over my own narrative and the narrative of my own people. So what was amazing about Vaseline and Unilever is that for the very first time, they allowed me to bring in my purpose, to bring in all these other things that I wanted to do in order to also achieve what they wanted to achieve. So I did this campaign, we launched these, we designed these tubs, and what is amazing about it is that you might look at this and think it's a beautiful image, the beautiful creative direction, but this campaign, its main purpose was if people, when people bought these tubs, a lot of the funds were used to actually build centers to deal with skincare issues in poverty-stricken parts of South Africa. And our aim is to reach one million South Africans by this year to help them with skin conditions. And so these are the kind of projects that I've been doing. Now, going to the end of my speech is that horrible things happen in life when you have a goal. And sometimes you can look at your life and think, why God? Why me? Why am I suffering? Why are other people doing amazing things? But I want to make you understand that every single one of you sitting here have a very unique journey. And God is never late. That's what you must understand. God doesn't move with Instagram. God doesn't move with Twitter. God doesn't move with Netflix. God doesn't move with likes. He moves according to your anointing. And always remember that when you might think that it's the very end. But I always look at the crucifixion of Jesus in the Bible where he's crushing, he was embarrassed, people were throwing stones at him, they were killing him, they were stabbing him because he had a purpose. But what they didn't realize was that they were elevating him to his next level of power. I stand here today as a testimony that life can break you so many times. But when you follow your heart, when you follow your instinct, no matter what people say, no matter what people do, they can never take away what God has given you. And through every experience, each time you fall, you get up stronger than ever before. I have fallen so many times before, but ngoku, bayaqoka. Bayaqoka ngoku. Bayaqoka ngoku. And another thing, I'm almost done, I'm so sorry. And another thing that I want to share with you today, yekanu monelana. Yekanu umolelana. As people of color, we have suffered for centuries. And when we look at things like apartheid, we always think sometimes it was about the law, about the land, and all these different things which it was about. But most importantly, it was about this and this. And you see the effects of apartheid in the way we treat each other as black people. The way we treat each other as black people is actually so sad. I look at my business, I look at the things that I've achieved and the things that I've failed at, and part of my failures, or part of the heartbreaking things that have happened in my career, have been because sometimes of black people who want to destroy each other. I want to tell you this, in South Africa right now, we are in a very unique position, a very unique one. 
We can look at everything that's happening in our country and we can focus on what is bad, what the government is not doing. But the most powerful thing that we have is each other. And if we can work together, I promise you we're going to do so many amazing things. I believe that South Africa, in my opinion, I've traveled around the world. And I still think that this continent is the most talented in the world. And South Africa specifically, I believe, is the most creative place in the planet. We have so many different cultures. We have so many different stories. We have so many different struggles. And all those things are the things that we should use to propel ourselves. You don't need to be the next Beyonce or the next Kanye West. Be your next self. Be your next self. Be you. Be you. And for me, what I've also learned in my journey as well and why I use fashion, my fashion passion is not about showing me that I'm dressed better than you. I want to inspire people to be themselves. Because what I've learned personally is that working with Europeans and Americans, they are who themselves, even when they're here. But when, I, when, when we are confident in ourselves, we are called arrogant. But that doesn't matter. Be who you are. And my dream is the same dream that Vincent has had. Yes, it's nice to make money from brands, you know, all these different European brands and American brands. Yes, it's nice for us to travel the world and go to New York Fashion Week. But for me personally, all those things don't faze me because... I want to see a young South African build the next Nike. I want to see the next young South African woman be president. I want to see us owning these spaces. I want to see us having our own boats. I want to see us building our own economy. And for that to happen, collaboration needs to happen. Masieke ni utakatana, please. One last point. Last point that I really, really want to make. That I really want to make. It's 16 days of activism. That's one of the biggest things that is crumbling our country. Our country will never go anywhere. We can never ever build wealth collectively if we keep killing our women. Our women are the foundation of our society. And if we keep killing them, no matter if you're an entrepreneur with a dream, there, here, on a bigger scale, we're all going to suffer. And classitetange abuse on these kind of platforms, guba mandi because we all agree. But classi goduga, kaushle na machitawako and someone is calling a girl a bitch, what do you do in that instance? When someone you know is abusing someone, what do you do in that instance? All of us in this room have been part of the stereotype when it comes to abuse. All of us as men in this room, this thing of not me, all of us in, as men in this room, we are as responsible. Even women sometimes. Because I've been in spaces, I'll even confess, where you know, a woman is like, oh yeah, Lamdan Amanda, she's a bitch. And guys are like, yeah, she's a hoe as well. That's what we do on a daily basis. That's where abuse begins. It begins in we, what we're seeing right now happening with men killing and all these things. It begins in small doses. When we are young, we need to have conversations about sex to our boys from a young age. Let's have the conversation, guys, please. Let's have the conversations. As men, we need to talk about our mental health issues and stop taking out our issues on our women. They're not there to fix us. A woman is not there to carry you. A woman is there to be a partner if you love her. Or if you're a man married to another, whatever your sexuality is, but a partner is not there to complete you. A partner is not there to be your behind or whatever. A partner is there to be by your side. And together you should grow spiritually. Love is not a transaction. Sex is not a transaction. It's a spiritual practice. Sex is a spiritual practice. Yes, you might think it's just sex, but your soul keeps count. Your soul keeps count. So in these 16 days of activism, let's have the conversations as men. Let's have the conversation as parents. Let's have the conversations as entrepreneurs. What can we do to better our society? Thank you very much. Your time is now. Let's build a great nation. Thank you.